Hey everybody, this is Kyle with the Pardon My Jerk podcast. I'm coming to you this evening solo for the first time uh, to talk to you a little bit about our wrap-up of the first weekend of semi-final events. So uh, due to some scheduling complications and uh, as it turns out, being a new dad is pretty difficult at times. Uh, unfortunately tonight, the other guys are not able to join me, but I want to make sure I still get some killer content out to you this week. So what I'm going to do with you this evening is just spend some time talking to you a little bit about my observations from the first week of semifinals. This weekend, we saw the Torian Pro, the Australian semifinal, and we saw the Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge. Um... Both wonderful races. Congratulations to all the athletes that have punched their games tickets out of those competitions. Let's take a second to make sure we go over this. Uh, and so everybody's on the same page. First place in the women's division for the Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge. The first of four North American semifinals. We have Tia Claire Toomey, second. We have Haley Adams, third. Brooke Wells, fourth. Amanda Barnhart, fifth. Jessica Griffith, and with their ticket and uh, punching their ticket into the last chance qualifier will be Christine Colenbrander, Fee Sagafi, Nicole Gibson Burke, and Danielle Dunlap. That's the women's side of the Mid Atlantic CrossFit Challenge. On the men's side, we have Jason Hopper winning the whole thing, Scott Panchik taking second, Justin Madero's third, Travis Mayer fourth, Zach Watts fifth, with Tyler Eggerman, Angelo DiCicco, and Hunter Holyfield making the last chance qualifier. If you're curious, four women made the last chance qualifier out of the MAC and three men because uh, Tia Claire Toomey, due to travel restrictions, was forced to compete out of her own continental. Uh, so they passed that on to an additional last chance qualifier spot to a female who did not qualify in the top five. Additionally, this weekend, we had the Torian Pro, the Oceana Regional Semifinal, Continental, whatever you want to call them anymore. Uh, we'll start with the men's side here. Royce Dunn is back, coming with a first place finish, narrowly edging out a wonderful race between he and Jay Crouch in second. Third, Baden Brown came surging back on day three uh, to finish in third place, and that will be the cutoff line for the men out of the Torian Pro. Uh, behind him, we have James Newberry, Luke Fiso and Con Porter all qualifying out of the Oceanic region for the last chance qualifier. Uh, the females, we are going to see Cara Saunders winning it. No surprises there. Laura Clifton and Ellie Turner. Laura Clifton, I believe, has qualified in the past, but Ellie Turner will be a games rookie for us. Uh, coming in at the four, five, six spots, we have Alethea Boone, who is already qualified as a Masters athlete, but will get a crack at that last chance qualifier, uh, narrowly missing that third place spot behind Ellie Turner. We have Maddie Sturt, multi-time games athlete, and Justine Booth, another past games qualifier. So, with me going solo tonight, what I wanted to do is since I don't have anyone here to bounce any ideas off of, uh, what I want to be able to provide you are, are a handful of my observations. I intently watched pretty much every minute of the Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge uh, this weekend. So I do have some strong opinions there. And I saw a good bit of the Torium Pro. I believe I saw at least every final heat of every event. Uh, and I, so I do have a few opinions there. So I did write some things down as I walk, as I watched the, uh, watched the competition and, uh, just some, a couple things I want to share with you. Number one, first observation, this came from watching the, uh, day one event at the mid Atlantic CrossFit challenge and watching the event where they, we displayed the one rep max snatch of the competing athletes. 
And the thing I've written down here is that strength events are broken. They're broken. Now, we've done podcasts in the past where we talked a little bit about how we feel about how CrossFit is handling the tests of strength in a competitive environment. Now, I don't explicitly have an issue with testing specifically the snatch or the clean and jerk. Uh, we've expressed in the past, we just think it's a little bit of an overused event to see the one rep max snatch slash clean and jerk. But what we observed this weekend was very interesting in that we saw several males, as I count through, no less than six, no less than six when we see Ben Smith, Mark Hutchinson, Zach Watts, Travis Mayer, Scott Panchik, and Jason Hopper all snatch 300 pounds in an event in which they only had three attempts in a finite amount of time. So potentially there, there are more gentlemen on that floor capable of doing it. So now what we're seeing is a massive sort of bottleneck that's being created where there's not a ton of men that are going to be snatching 315 pounds, but that bottom end of the, of the field now, that those numbers are working their way up further and further and further. So we're seeing the average be 275, 285. And my issue with this is that's such a consistent test now. The athletes know the answers to the test before it's even starting. And we need to find ways to take them to the periphery of their abilities and their training and test it in a different way because we've just seen that these athletes know what's coming and it's creating this massive sort of log jam where we're not really seeing athletes sort of, athletes sort of separate themselves uh, through the competition. So I would, I would love to have some people to bounce this idea off of here, but I just started some of them saying, I'm like, okay, yeah, he's going to snatch 275. Okay, 295. Okay, 280. There's a 300. There's another 300. Let's see something that can create a little bit more separation. Uh, would be nice to see. Uh, number two, this became glaringly apparent to me uh, right around day three. And that comp train may have a slight problem. Comp Train is well known for having their athlete uh, academy. They have a select few athletes that train together under the tutelage of Mr. Ben Bergeron, a coach whom I respect and look up to very much. The issue here is they have four main athletes to my knowledge, probably a few more, um, but I believe the four main ones that we that we have here are Amanda Barnhart, uh, Katrin David's daughter, uh, come on now, uh, Chandler Smith, and Sam Quant. Chandler Smith has given us every reason to think that he is going to perform at a very high level this year. However, the other athletes that we saw uh, performing this weekend actually were Sam Quant and Amanda Barnhart. Amanda Barnhart was in a relatively commanding position in a very tight race throughout the entire weekend. What we see is that this competition ends on Sunday with Amanda Barnhart tying the fifth place contestant in Jessica Griffith at 468 points. As in, if Amanda Barnhart had even the slightest slip up, her margin of victory over the sixth place Christine Kohlenbrander was two points. Guys, we're talking about someone who finished in the top 10 at the games in 2019. Now we've had, she's had two years of preparation to train and advance her skills. And we see her as, by, by all accounts, a bubble athlete in the field. So I would say Amanda Barnhart would probably look at her performance this weekend as potentially a regression. Uh, two. Sam Quant, the second place finisher in the 2020 CrossFit Games, did not qualify out of this field and missed his qualification by a significant margin in 14th place. This is a multi-time games athlete right in the prime of his career, finished in 14th place. Again, another athlete we saw qualify for the game several times, 
move over to the comp train team and it appears as though we have observed another regression additionally we've seen athletes like brooke wells leave the comp train team move down to tennessee where they kind of got their own sort of thing going on uh spending some time training with tia and we're seeing the best years of brooke wells career these last couple years so I think there needs to be a little bit of introspection for the comp train team because it seems that we're seeing a regression with these athletes when they spend time, when they convert over to the comp train team and a progression when they tend to leave the team. I'll, I won't even mention Matt Fraser's name. There's a, a lot of other evidence that can go into that, but we're going to keep things moving. Uh, three, and we're going to get into a couple of generalities here with some athletes that I was just very impressed by. Uh, first and foremost, what's there to say about Miss Tia Claire Toomey or that hasn't already been said? It is her competition to lose. My bet is that on Sunday this year at the games, she will already have the games completely mathematically wrapped up. The only person standing in Tia's way would probably be Tia. Now, next, I saw Travis Mayer. Now, this was an incredibly stacked men's field. Now, Travis Mayer did finish in fourth place, but the guys he finished behind were no slouches. We'll, we're going to talk a little bit about Jason Hopper later, but the two gentlemen in front of him were Justin Medeiros, the third place finisher in the 2020 CrossFit Games, and longtime top 10 finisher Scott Panchik. The fact of the matter is we've seen a career season out of Travis Mayer this year, and he continued to build upon it and step up to the plate in this live competition. Uh, next we have Ben Smith, Ben Smith. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Ben Smith, but unfortunately I think this may have been Ben Smith's swan song. Uh, he did not finish with the indie place. I think he would have expected himself to be in. Uh, he was on the bubble going into day three, but Ben ended up finishing in 10th place this weekend. <clears throat> Now, the uh, observation that my wife had made about Ben Smith is that Ben Smith's success as an athlete tends to come and go with the presence of a heavy weights, heavy barbell, heavy dumbbell, heavy kettlebell deadlifts, whatever that, that implement is. The heavier the weights are, the better Ben Smith tends to do in the Metcon. Now, we're going to address the programming for the Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge a little bit later, but what I will say is that this competition was very light. We saw one rep max, and that was pretty much the end of heavy weights. We saw 135 thrusters and overhead walking lunges, but at that level, I would pretty much call that moderate weight at best. So we saw in, in a competition that put a high emphasis on cardio machines, put a high emphasis on gymnastics movements, and we saw Ben Smith's performance suffer. And the fact of the matter is, Father Time is undefeated. I know Ben has other commitments in his life. I would love to see him back, and I think we will see him compete again. But I think his run at the games appears to be over. Next, we're going to talk about another athlete out of the Torian that I've been incredibly impressed by, and he did not disappoint. My eye was on him for this weekend, and that's Mr. Jay Crouch. Jay Crouch won the Open out of the Oceana Division. Jay Crouch won the quarterfinals out of the Oceana Division. And Jay Crouch very well could have won the semifinal at Torian Pro. It came down to a narrow finish between he and previous games athlete Royce Dunn. Jay Crouch was incredibly impressive. He is my man to keep an eye on out of that part of the world. I think he he is in prime position to make some noise <clears throat> at the games. Uh, unfortunately, I really think it just came down to programming. We saw going down the stretch, uh, Royce Dunn survived the workouts that were not strong ones for him early on to come back and destroy workouts that were a little bit more in his wheelhouse for an athlete that's six foot plus. 220 plus, possibly the strongest athlete in the entire games field. Now it's gone too long of me talking and talking and talking and not mentioning the name Jason Hopper. Who the hell is this guy? 
And where did that performance come from? Because he was unbelievably impressive. Unbelievably impressive. Uh, definitely a person to have your eye on. I don't see any reason why this guy does not have the ability to finish in the top five of the games. Now, I'm going to play talk out the other side of my mouth. Because Jason Hopper was incredibly impressive. A large athlete. He seemed to have the uh, the mental acuity upstairs beyond his years and beyond his level of, of high level comp- competitive experience. Uh, he's a larger athlete, which made it even more impressive. And he seems to dominate on longer grinder type of events. Look out, Brent Fakowski. Now, I will talk out the other side of my mouth, though, in the sense that what we've seen through the first three legs of these games is. It's all CrossFit. It's all CrossFit. They're, it's lifting heavy weights, CrossFit Metcons, and where we really see the fittest man, woman, and team on earth tend to emerge is at the games level where we start throwing a different type of test at these athletes that they're not always accustomed to seeing in the gym setting. So where when do we see that Matt Fraser and Tia Claire Toomey or are the fittest human beings on earth. When we throw in a paddleboard, when we throw in a sandbag that you have to throw over a hay bale, when we have to run an obstacle course and drag a dummy and we're doing thick thick rope rope climbs, right? When we have to handstand walk over an, over an obstacle course. Dave Castro is gonna find the fittest person on earth by putting you into situations you are uncomfortable in. And I'm not saying Hopper can't can handle it. But I look forward to the opportunity to see when we don't see just progressively higher skill CrossFit Metcons as the test. I look forward to seeing uh, exactly what it is that Hopper can handle. We got a little bit of it at Mac. And when we saw that torque tank being used, which I am a huge fan of. And Hopper, I believe, without checking on it, won that event. So, uh, one of my favorite young athletes has come along in a come along for a while uh really excited to see it this could be we may be starting to see kind of an introduction of this next generation of athletes that's going to kind of swoop in and and take the torch from these previous ones that appears it may be starting to age out a little bit uh next welcome back angelo de chico man i was probably cheering harder for him than anybody else in the field this weekend uh love seeing the former may the current mayhem athlete uh come back to competition For those who don't know angelo DeChico is a multi-time champion in the teen division that tried to make the transition into the individual open division uh but due to a degenerative back injury was forced to walk away from competition for multiple years uh i honestly didn't even know he was getting back to the competitive field until uh about a month or so ago I uh, was super excited to see his name, and he did not disappoint. So Angelo is rewarded for his efforts. He is going to get a shot at the last chance qualifier. Uh, I look forward to seeing who his uh, opponents are going to be, but I'm absolutely going to be rooting for him. Such a cool story from Angelo. Uh, don't want to leave Torian out of this too much. Uh, there were some great races there. Not so much on the women's side. The men's side were very interesting. Uh, I just thought there was a massive disparity in terms of talent between the top and the bo- and the the top quarter and the bottom three quarters at that event. And uh, that's something I want to unpack on a later podcast because I think that's going to be an issue that we see a lot moving forward in a lot of these events, where the top five, six, seven, you know, if you're I don't think any other field is going to be as dense on this as this Mac field was outside of potentially Europe. But what we're seeing is there's a huge disparity between the quality of talent at the top and we're not really seeing a ton of depth, right? It's really just kind of shuffling chairs on who like the top six to seven people are in every single event. But with that being said, Torian put on a spectacular show, spectacular show. Um, uh, huge fan of the program that they provided. Uh, obviously the, the, uh, triathlon wasn't the most entertaining thing to watch, but I'm a fan of it as a test to the athletes. And I like how they kind of just gave them the long event, 
They wanted to test endurance. Here it is. Let's move on. Uh, I spoke about how I'm not a huge fan of the one rep max clean and jerk and snatch. I believe the latter format that they employed is probably one of the more watchable ways of doing it, uh, particularly on the team side when I watched that. Um, but Torian, uh, spectacular venue. Uh, I love the outdoor venues. Uh, the fans seem to be pretty supportive. I love that there was a community aspect to it in a team division and community division, a master's division. <clears throat> And they provided that whole sort of event festival atmosphere for everybody. A uh, big fan of the programming at Torian. I have to say that the Move It or Lose It Volume 3 event was by far my favorite event of the weekend. I love the interval format. Uh, I love the, pos the position that it was put in in the weekend where we saw an athlete at Con Porter sell his soul to keep himself alive. I love these interval events and seeing these guys just go all out to get those points. And it was just a fun one to observe as a spectator because we can watch in front of us how this event is advancing. I can see right in front of me who is winning and why. And it just progressed really quickly. Uh, so great job to Torian. Let's talk about Mac. Okay. Um, now, Mac, they generally do a pretty decent job, and this event was not without its solid tests. Um, I love that it was in the Thompson Bowling Arena. Uh, I love the area that it's in. I uh, love that there was plenty of fans there. Uh, but let's talk about some sort of weaknesses that they had there. Uh, one, not the best television work on the streaming service i think the people that that work for the crossfit games that are now associated with streaming these semifinal events are still kind of finding their stride as far as how they're setting up the event the staging of the event if you will uh and how they're setting up the camera work for them because watching it at times just wasn't they just didn't have the camera positioned or on the right person or in a way that we can just see what is going on here in telling a story with the tools that we have uh from there really important thing for me is is always going to be programming what's the validity of this test and the thing about these about uh this event was it was a little bit on the longer side with uh most of the events I felt, uh, or several of the events, uh, what we saw with, so we saw the one rep max snatch snooze alert, uh, for me at this point, I've just seen it so many times. We just need to find a different way for this to get done. Uh, need for speed. This event with the, the torque tank, I thought was fabulous. Great job. Great test. I love weird implements getting thrown in for that. They have a hard time preparing for. I love that rep domain of the 45, 30, 15. I don't know how much these guys are seeing that in, in training. Now from there, uh, it starts to slip a little bit. The inception event I thought was a great endurance event. I thought it was a great test of endurance that didn't just involve them sitting on a machine for 30 minutes. Now, this is where it gets kind of weak. So Gretel was not a fan. And don't get me wrong. I love fast events. I love the sub three minute, the sub three minute couplets, you know, those types of events. The problem with me with Gretel was I love the fast ones, but we're honestly slowing them down by them doing these clean and jerks. In my opinion, make the clean and jerks either heavy and we're going to test who's strong, like a make the clean and jerks even 185 to the point that they just have to reel in a little bit on their speed or leave them at 135 and just make them snatches. So that, then we can really see these athletes push the tempo here. They're all going fast. They're all going unbroken, but we can see how quick they can go on those snatches rather than forcing them to take that movement and break it uh, into two separate movements and slow them down unnecessarily. Uh, those athletes could have gone faster. It could have gone smoother and could have been much more about pushing that pace and pushing into that pain cave. Uh, Tri-Wizard Cup. 
it was okay. It was kind of busy. Uh, another one that was on the longer side for a lot of athletes. Um, just wasn't the most fascinating thing to watch. And we, we saw machines come back. And then Kratos. Kratos was decent. Uh, I saw what they were trying to do there with the final. They wanted to make it visual. Uh, honestly, I like this event better if you just get rid of the handstand push-ups. I think it would be much more interesting to watch if we're seeing athletes run back and forth between dumbbell snatches and legless rope climbs rather than this sort of slow, methodical kind of approach they took. Uh, I really want to see them slip into the pain cave and really, really push on that event. So... Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge, very in line with the way they would normally program, I felt. Um, I wasn't particularly impressed as far as just the watchability of about half of those events, maybe uh, maybe a little bit less. Um, coming down the stretch here, uh, one thing we've definitely observed from these athletes is they have made good use of these last two years. And by that, I mean... We haven't really seen very much live competition for at least a year and a half. And we came back not really knowing what to expect. We're looking at these athlete rosters, and there's obviously a plenty of names that we've never heard of. Now, this could have ended up being like regionals where the usual suspects rise to the top and they dominate. And uh, all those new names don't really matter. But as I mentioned earlier, there are some names that have came to the forefront that are exciting young athletes that have been waiting in the way, what's the expression, waiting in the wind? I don't know what that means, but waiting for their opportunity to strike and have an opportunity and get that game's ticket, right? So beyond the obvious of Jason Hopper, we saw Zach Watts. Zach Watts is a longtime open warrior, finally gets his opportunity, but all kinds of names here that we've never seen are going to get an opportunity at the games. We have Tyler Eggeman, Hunter Holyfield, Mark Hutchinson, uh, Cam Crockett performed ex uh, extremely well going down the stretch uh, in the Mid-Atlantic CrossFit Challenge. On top of that, we have Christine Colenbrander, not a household name, but a several time, multiple time games athlete on the team side of things. Uh, going to get her opportunity. We have Fee Sagafi, uh, Nicole Gibson Burke, and Danielle Dunlap. Lots of new names and fresh blood that we can see out there uh, competing at the highest level that I'm really looking forward to. And it's not just in the North America division either, right? We had we have Jay Crouch, who's going to be brand new. We've got uh, Luke DeJong was extremely impressive throughout the weekend on the men's field, men's side in Oceana. And the women's side, we have Laura Clifton and Ellie Turner, who have been who had spectacular performance, beating out several games veterans to punch their ticket to Madison. So, a couple of few more things I want to go over here. Uh, holy shit, Becca Voigt! Holy shit! I should have brought this up a little bit sooner. Uh, Becca Voigt, for those of you that don't know, is a Masters athlete. Uh, not in the 35 to 39, folks. She is in the 40 to 45 division. Becca Voigt competed at Aromas, okay? She competed at the Aromas CrossFit Games, and she is still out here kicking ass and did not perform terribly. She finished in 18th place, as in she beat several other very respectable athletes, including uh, Paige Henry, Megan O'Donnell. These are not slouches. These were people we were looking forward to competing on this at this stage. Emma Chapman is another one. So congratulations to Becca Voigt on another highly impressive performance. Good luck to you at the games in the Masters Division. Uh, can't wait to see you perform more going in the future. And the last thing I want to talk about, I didn't mention too much about the teams. Uh, I watched a good bit of the Torian teams, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I was somewhat underwhelmed, okay? Uh, I honestly see that see Mayhem showing up to the games as uh, more of a coronation than anything, uh, rather than a competition. I can't imagine any team really pushing Mayhem too much. And hats off to Rich, man. 
that's this is not a criticism of him. Hats off to him. The guy's playing chess when everyone else is playing checkers. He's professionalizing the team part of the sport, and it's not his fault. No one else has caught up with him. Okay, uh, they got off there to a rocky start in day one at the MAC, and then from there, I mean, it was pretty much walking pace the rest of the way. And I'd love to see it because the fact of the matter is teams like CrossFit Mayhem Freedom and athletes like Rich Froning and Andrea Nissler are great for the sport because they are going to raise the level of competition between those around them. All these other teams are not going to like getting the shit kicked out of them every time they have a competition or knowing CrossFit Mayhem is there. They have no shot at it. So guess what? There are people out there that are going to get tired of that, and they are going to make their own super teams, and people are going to move for it, and it is going to raise the bar of the sport. The team part of the CrossFit Games should not be the feeder minor league program for the individuals. We should see these guys put on that same level of pedestal, and I think it's great. That being said, uh, just like sort of a shower thought I kind of came to while watching Torian, I believe. Uh, on Friday night. And uh, we just need some new implements for teams that are allowing the teams to function together and test fitness as a team. So we see so much of the worm. And don't get me wrong, the worm is awesome. And for those of you who have never used one, it is a lot harder than it looks. But I want to see some more some more implements like the Big Bob, like the kit carry that we saw, I think, in 2015. These implements that test the fitness of the team as a whole. So what we start seeing are some shorter, more easily digestible team events that are not essentially just variations of team relays, right? Uh if the less synchro stuff we can see, I think oftentimes the better. It certainly has its place, but I think it's a little overused. Uh, if I never see another team deadlift again in my life, it will be too soon. I personally don't believe that has any place in competition. So the point I'm making is uh, I, would, I wish that these people, these event organizers, would have some access to some different equipment that would allow these athletes to sort of work together so we can create these shorter time domain events that test the whole team together and make you only as strong as your weakest link. But also just to make things a little bit more entertaining and offer a little bit more creativity as far as programming goes. So the uh, the the first thing that jumped into my head that I want to that I referred back to are the devices that uh, men and women that row crew use to hook their row, their row ergs up together to practice rowing in concert as a team. So there are basically devices out there you can connect your concept to rowers together so that you have to row within the same rhythm and understand how to row together in the same way that competitive rowers would have to out on the water. I've used it before. It's an incredible device. It's wonderful for testing teams together. Uh, I would love to see some more items like that splashed into the CrossFit games for to test these teams. So that being said, I think that just about covers everything I had to say on this previous weekend's semifinals. Sorry that I'm late to the party. Crazy week of scheduling for myself and the guys. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to be back to you guys real soon. Um, if you guys loved hearing me go solo tonight, uh, if you hated it, uh, please feel free. Leave some information in the comments. Uh, leave us a review. Give us a follow on Instagram. Give us a follow on Facebook. And if you have any listener questions out there, please do not hesitate to share them. Uh, we love hearing feedback. We love hearing questions. And we would love the opportunity to answer them on the air. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you real soon.